so yes we will now look into the um, prophetic books starting with the book of isaiah now isaiah had a very long ministry this is a man who ministered for almost 40 years as a prophet you know starts off at a young age and right into his old age he continues his ministry he he lives during the lifespan of three kings um he when he first comes to the throne uh, you know you have jotham uh, because uzziah has just died and now jotham is on the throne uh, you know the in judah so he's there during the lifetime of jotham and then ahaz and also during the time of hezekiah so isaiah is a prophet who was there during the lifetime of three different kings of judah and um, he writes a prophetic book uh, which has got 66 chapters and it's important for us to know that this book of isaiah is divided into three main sections and there is a very clear distinction between these three sections uh, the first section would be chapters 1 to 39 in these chapters chapters 1 to 39 he basically uh, gives a lot of prophecies and warnings to the people both of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom telling them that if they do not give up their idolatry and their sinful ways god's judgment is going to come upon them very very soon so in the first section chapters 1 to 39 uh, you have prophecies which are addressed to both the northern and the southern kingdoms. And exactly as Isaiah prophesied, right during his lifetime itself, while he is still alive, just as he had prophesied, the Assyrian kings, they come and they conquer the northern kingdom. And all the people of the northern kingdom are taken away as slaves to Assyria. So the judgment actually comes upon northern kingdom right during the lifetime of Isaiah itself. What about the southern kingdom? The judgment comes upon the southern kingdom about a hundred years later. All that discussion over there, guys, if you could just do it later. Um, you know, so, so the southern kingdom, uh, the judgment comes after his, you know, after his death, about a hundred years after his time is when the judgment comes upon the southern kingdom. So that would be chapters 1 to 39. The second main section is chapters 40 to 55. So in chapters 40 to 55, basically he is writing to the people who are going to one day come back from exile. Okay? The southern kingdom has not even fallen yet. The people have not even gone into slavery to Babylon yet. And the exiles have definitely not come back yet. All of this has not happened yet. It's going to happen in the future, in the distant future, 100 years later. But he's talking about those events in these chapters. He, long before these things ever happened, he starts talking about them. So in chapters 40 to 55, he's mainly talking about how one day the exiles will come back to their homeland. God will bring them back. God will remember his promises and he will, you know, fulfill the things which he had told them would take, take place. So he, in uh, chapters 40 to 55, there is hope given to the people saying that those who were taken away to Babylon will come back one day and God will restore them again. And then you come to the third section. The third section would be chapters 56 to 66. And in these chapters, he's talking about the distant future. He's talking about the new heaven and the new earth, which even we have not seen. So he's talking about things which are going to cover a large span of time. So in 40 to 55, he's talking about the time of the exile and the restoration. And then when you come to the last section, he's talking about things which even we have not yet seen. He's talking about things which will happen in the future in 56 to 66. So these are the three main sections in the book of Isaiah. Now, some scholars, or rather I should say many scholars, uh, had an issue with this. They said, how is it possible that 200 years before Cyrus was born, uh, Isaiah knew about his name and wrote over there in the scripture saying that God will use Cyrus to bring the people back from exile. How could Isaiah know that? So definitely, 
this second portion of the of uh, isaiah and the third portion must have been written by people in the time of you know after the time of exile after they came back home at that time somebody named himself isaiah and wrote the second portion and then someone else wrote the third portion that is the way it must have happened you know complete lack of belief in the power of god to, to foretell the future and complete lack of belief in the prophets of god that they will be able to hear from god and be able to accurately record what god is revealing so people who do not believe in the power of god people who do not believe in true prophets who can prophesy the future they came up with this idea that there is somebody called the second isaiah and the third isaiah so sometimes when you open a bible commentary you may find these terms deutero isaiah d e u t e r o that basically means second isaiah and you may find the term trito isaiah t r i t o the third isaiah there's no deutero isaiah and there's no trito isaiah those are the imaginings of scholars who lack faith in a living god who lack faith in the power of prophecy and the accuracy of prophecy so yes the isaiah who lived in the time of jotham and ahaz that same isaiah wrote about cyrus 200 years even before cyrus a man named cyrus you know came into existence he wrote about him by name mentioning that such a man would one day come and um, maybe we can actually read out a couple of those verses because it's beautiful to see that these verses were written by a man um um you know uh, who lived 200 years before it actually even took place so maybe we could have someone read out for us isaiah 44 verse 28 isaiah 44 28 yeah because we are kind of short of time as usual if someone could please read me as i who says of who says of cyrus he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasure saying to jerusalem you shall be built and to the temple your foundation shall be laid yes so here uh, you know and uh, if, if anyone would like to come and increase the volume over here uh, you could do that otherwise it's all right so in isaiah 44:28 um it talks about how god will use cyrus as his shepherd to accomplish all that the lord pleases okay so and and in fact uh, we, we are told over here, oh no no I'm, i didn't mean my volume i meant the volume for those who would like to listen to the verses which were read out just now that oh, thanks thank you so um so here uh, we see that isaiah 4428 is talking about uh, this cyrus by name again in isaiah 451 again his name is mentioned directly and it says this is what the lord says to his anointed to cyrus whose right hand i take hold of okay so in these scriptures Cyrus the king of Persia is mentioned by name 200 years before he was even born okay. and uh, when we come to the new testament we see that the bible uh, the you know um, um the jesus and the writers of the gospels believed in one single isaiah not in any deutero or trito isaiah so let's look at john john chapter 12 38 to 41 uh so if someone could quickly read out for us john chapter 12 38 to 41 so that the word so that the word spoken by prophet isaiah might be fulfilled lord who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the lord been relieved therefore they could not believe for again isaiah said he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and i would heal them isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him 
Yeah, so here we see that uh, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is giving two quotations from Isaiah. The first quotation, uh, which is in John chapter 12, verse 38, that quotation is found in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, which is basically from the second section of uh, the book of Isaiah. The next quotation, you know, which is John chapter 12, verse 39 onwards, where it says he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. That portion is basically from Isaiah chapter 6, which is the first section in the book of Isaiah. So basically, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying the first section of Isaiah and the second section of Isaiah are written by the same person, by Isaiah the prophet. Which Isaiah? The Isaiah who saw the glory of Jesus. When did Isaiah see the glory of Jesus? That is basically when he had a vision of the Lord seated on his throne. You know, in Isaiah chapter 6. That is when he sees the glory of Jesus, when he sees the, the Almighty One seated on the throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. So that Isaiah, that same Isaiah wrote the first section, the same Isaiah wrote the second section and the third section. So um, these scholars who claim to be scholars, maybe should really read the scriptures before they come up with theories like that. So yes, coming to just one, maybe one incident which we can cover from the book of Isaiah um, due to lack of time, uh, we will look at the story of Ahaz, uh, which is covered in chapter 7. So in chapter 7, basically what happens is that you have Ahaz sitting on the throne. Uh, after Jotham, you have Ahaz coming to the throne. And we, when we were doing Chronicles, I think we talked about Ahaz very briefly. And we, you know, we reflected on the fact that he was a very evil king who actually closed the doors of the temple. He didn't even want the people to worship the living God. He wanted everyone to go into idolatry. So he literally closes the, tem uh, the doors of the temple. And then when his son comes to the throne, when Hezekiah comes to the throne, he reopens the doors of the temple. So this Ahaz is that kind of an evil person. And during his lifetime, you know, the Assyrians are getting more and more powerful because very shortly, you know, they're going to come and conquer northern Israel. They're in a very powerful position at the moment and all the nations are feeling afraid of them. So in that uh, environment, uh, at that time, uh, the king of northern Israel, a man named Pika, and the king of um, Syria, Rezin, these two kings, they approach Ahaz and they say, you know, get into a partnership with us. If we all get together, all three of us get together with our armies, then we can go and attack Assyria. And um, Ahaz is scared to do that. So he says, no, no, I don't want to be part of that kind of a partnership. You do people, you, you know, you both do what you want. Don't get me involved in this. And the two kings are very angry with Ahaz and they want to attack him. So when they send a message to him saying, if you don't partner with us, we'll attack you. He is very, very scared and terrified. At that time, the Lord gives him a prophecy through Isaiah in chapter 7. So this is what God says, you know, uh, God sends Isaiah to him and says, say to him, you know, the Lord tells Isaiah, say to him, be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid. Do not lose heart. Okay, see, so these are the comforting words which the living God sends to this very wicked king saying, you know, don't lose heart. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. And God says, this is the promise which God gives him. Uh, that would be in uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 8. Uh, okay, in verse 4, the Lord says, you know, be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid. That's verse 4. And then when we come to verse 8, the Lord says, Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. So basically, God is saying in another 65 years, northern Israel will stop being northern Israel. They'll all be taken away as slaves. So you don't even have to worry about the king of Israel. And as for the king of um, Syria, you know, he's just the ruler of Damascus. No need to be scared of him. So that's basically what God says to Ahaz. 
and then Ahaz does not still believe, he's still feeling very, very scared. And so then in verse 18, Isaiah chapter 7, um, uh, verse, sorry, verse 10. Yeah, uh, in verse 10, the Lord says, again, the Lord spoke to him. Okay, Isaiah 7, 10. Again, the Lord spoke to him. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. So now Isaiah says uh, to Ahaz, you know, even though the Lord is comforting you, you're still feeling very scared. But so ask for a sign. The Lord will give you a sign to prove that he will indeed do what he is telling. And uh, then Ahaz, you know, acting very uh, artificially holy, he says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. It sounds like very noble words. You know, he's saying, oh, I will I'll definitely not ask for a sign. You know, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. But the point is, he's not asking the Lord because he's already made up his mind that he's going to go to Assyria and tell them, you know, these two guys wanted to uh, wanted me to partner with them, but I stayed faithful. I have not partnered with them. So now you help me. They're trying to attack me. So he's already made up his mind about what he's going to do. So he doesn't want any help from the Lord. He's not interested in the living God at all. And then, you know, when he refuses to ask for a sign, the Lord is very angry. And this is what Isaiah says to him in verse 12. So then Isaiah says to him, will you try the patience of my God also? You know, so then he says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Whether you want a sign or not, a sign will be given to you. And this is the sign which is given. That would be verse um where are we? Uh, we are in verse 14, yes. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Um, maybe we can actually have someone read out those verses. Uh, so Isaiah 7, verse 14 up to verse 16. If someone could quickly read out, please. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Immanuel. He shall eat skirt and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the God. Good for before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. The land whose two kings you Dread will be destroyed. So, deserted. yeah. So here the Lord says, you know, um, a, a virgin, a young lady will give birth to a child. And before that child is old enough to start eating curds, you know, I mean, uh, in their culture, in those days, it was up to two and a half, three years of age that, you know, the mother would continue to breastfeed the child. And then uh, the solid food would start being given around the age of three. And that's basically when the child starts understanding that there's a difference between right and wrong. You know, when the mother says, no, don't do that. Now the child is able to understand enough to know, okay, I'm not supposed to do that. So it's a, it's the, it's the age of, of understanding um, around the age of three. So the Lord says before this, you know, before this child is old enough to even uh, eat curd or know the difference between right and wrong, these two kings that you're so scared about, they will be destroyed. No, so it's, it's what the Lord promises. So this word which God gives to Ahaz, we see that it has a double layer. One layer of prophecy was given directly to Ahaz. The second layer of prophecy which was there behind that, nobody even realized that there's one more layer of prophecy sitting behind. It's only in the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit Matthew records it and he says, all this took place, you know, Matthew chapter 1, 22 to 24. So Matthew says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. So this was actually a prophecy with two layers. One layer got fulfilled in the time of Ahaz, just as God had promised. But the other layer you know, was fulfilled only in the New Testament times when Mary um, conceived and gave birth to Jesus. So the thing to note over here is that in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, when that Hebrew word is used, Alma is the Hebrew word for 
virgin. A virgin shall conceive. The Hebrew word over there is Alma. Now, Alma is basically referring to a young woman. She may be a married woman who knows a man, or she may be an unmarried woman who has never been with a man. See, Alma can refer to a married woman who has slept with a man. Alma can also refer to a girl who has never ever slept with a man. It's just a term which talks about a young person. So that is the wording which is used over there. And some commentators say that maybe this Alma that is being referred to is um, Isaiah's wife itself. Because shortly after that, Isaiah's wife gives birth to a kid. And before that kid becomes old enough to eat curd, you know, these two kings are destroyed. So they say most probably, you know, God was referring in the prophecy to Isaiah's wife itself. Uh, um, and we don't have time to get into that story. That would have been interesting because God says, give that child a particular name and all of that. We don't have time to get, in, get into those details. But in Isaiah 7, 14, in the Hebrew Bible, that word can refer to a married lady or it can refer to just a young girl who has never been with a man. But when they were translating these verses into the Greek Septuagint, there... In the Septuagint version, they did not just use the word for a young woman. The word that they used over there was Parthenos. And Parthenos is a word which is definitely referring to a girl who has never ever been with a man. Very, very clear. Over there it's talking about a virgin who has never slept with a man. So that word is used in the Septuagint translation. And so when Matthew, you know, talks about this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, 23, he also uses, uses that same Greek word parthenos, which is talking about a girl who has never been with a man. Okay, so look at the way God allowed the two layers of the prophecy to develop. He allowed the, you know, the word Alma to be used for the first level of prophecy. But when the second level of prophecy was being recorded, he made sure that the people who are doing the translation into the Greek would not use a general word. It would have made common sense for them to use a general word. But somehow, they chose to use that word Parthenos, which literally talks about a girl who's never been with a man. And so the second layer of prophecy was fulfilled exactly the way the Lord wanted it to be fulfilled. So we see the Lord in charge and in control in all, in all of this, you know, in all of these events. Um, so, so Ahaz actually, you know, ignores the prophecy which has been given. And he, in fact, does go to, a, uh, to Assyria, to the Assyrian king. He tells him, you know, I'll give you this much, this much gold and silver. So please don't attack me, you know, leave me alone. And uh, the, these two kings are really angry. They come and they attack uh, Jerusalem. Uh, these things are recorded in 2 Chronicles 28, uh, verses 5 to 8, and also in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 5. So these two kings are very angry and they come and they attack. But just as God had prophesied, both of them, you know, they are, you know, they 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 perish um, shortly after. So Ahaz actually should not have made a deal with Assyria. Because even after giving all the gold and silver which he gave to Assyria, they anyway came and they attacked northern uh, Israel and conquered it. And then they come and attack all the southern cities also. You know, so he, it, was, it was a waste for him to, uh, to, to you know, have uh, made that deal. He should have listened to the Lord and he should, he should have actually accepted the Lord's protection. And so during the time of his son, that is basically when Senna Sherib comes. You know, that's when uh, they are attacking all the southern cities. And uh, so at that time, Hezekiah is rather scared and worried. And then the Lord comforts him. So unlike his father, who refused to take comfort in, the, in God's words, Hezekiah puts his trust in the Lord. And the Lord does a mighty miracle for Hezekiah. You know, if you remember, God sends an angel among the entire uh, enemy army, which is you know, surrounding uh, Jerusalem. And oh, without, any, you know, without Hezekiah having to fight any battle, all the soldiers die at the hand of the angels. So God would have done something spectacular even for Ahaz if he had chosen to trust in the Lord. But Ahaz just ignores the prophecy which is given, you know, and uh, so he brings trouble upon his head. Uh, so, so at that time, uh, when after Ahaz ignores 
the prophecy which the Lord had given at that time. That's basically when you have, uh, you know, Isaiah's wife giving birth to a child and the Lord gives the child a particular name. Um, you know, he says, name him um, Maharshalal Hashbaz. That's the name which is given to the child. And in fact, even before the naming of the child earlier itself, even before the child is born, God had already told them to write down that particular name on a scroll. So in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, Isaiah calls a couple of witnesses to come and you know stand over there. And with the witnesses watching, he writes down those words. And then later when his son is born, God asks him to actually name his son that particular wording. And that wording basically means, you know, in English, it would basically mean speedily spoil, quickly plunder. God is basically saying, don't worry, these two kings who are coming and attacking, you know, um, uh, they will perish. But because of Ahaz who has ignored the words of God, they will come speedily and they will plunder and create a lot of problem for Ahaz and go because he refused to trust in me. So in, in, in fact, it's what we see happening in, you know, which is, like I said, in Second Chronicles and Kings, it talks about those incidents. So God allows them to speedily come and quickly plunder because Ahaz refuses to trust in the Lord. Okay, we are out of time as usual. Um, yes, I think there are a couple of questions here. I am so sorry. This this uh, stand is, a, is rather high in height. So it was covering the questions. Uh, I will look at that later and I will definitely, you know, um, yeah, get back to your next class. Now we are out of time. We'll just close with a word of prayer. But I will address those things which are there uh, because it will anyway get recorded. Lord, we just thank you so much for today's class. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the book of um, Song of Solomon. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would take to heart the instructions which are given in that book about commitment and relationship and true love, O oh Lord, and apply them in our homes, in our families, to our own marriages, O oh Lord. And Lord, we also pray uh, at this time uh, with regard to the book of Isaiah. Lord, we pray that we would be like Hezekiah, who even though he was scared, he trusted in you when you gave a word of prophecy. Unlike his father, O oh Lord, who just ignored your words and brought trouble upon his head. Help us, O oh Lord, to learn from these lessons and apply them to our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.